happy birthday to us. Behavioral Health Today dropped its first episodes on April 20th, 2020. To celebrate our one-year mark, we're releasing five shows this week, one episode each day. Two will be brand new shows, and three will be some of our favorites from the past year. We hope you enjoy all of them, both new and old, and we're looking forward to year two of bringing you trending and relevant content in behavioral and mental health. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. In the field of psychology, evidence-based practice is driven by the conscientious, clear, and thoughtful use of current best evidence from available research data in making decisions about patient care. These evidence-based practices combined with clinical experience have been found to be efficacious and cost-effective for a wide range of treatment conditions. But what if presenting problems and treatment challenges require us to go outside the proverbial box of these identified approaches. In other words, when they do work, okay, but what about when they may not work in a very easy or tight fit in psychotherapy? To address this with me today is a returning guest, Dr. Susan Linton. I'm so excited to have her with us. Susan holds degrees in both interactive web design, development, and mental health, and is actively engaged with careers in both. She is president and CEO of Cybooks EHR and Portal. She's also a clinical psychologist with years of experience and practices out of Atlanta, Georgia. She specializes in abuse issues, dissociative disorders, eating and mood disorders, couples therapy, and she provides consultation and supervision services as well. Susan, welcome back to our show. Thank you so much, Graham. It's a delight to be here. It is really nice to to have you back. I, I, I am very excited to be with you today. This is part of our clinician series where you and I are going to be talking about some research related things and data we're probably going to throw out or, but what I really want to have the audience enjoy is the opportunity to hear two clinicians, you and me talking about the idea of evidence-based practice, but what about those times when we have to go or we find ourselves or we practice outside sometimes of what is clearly seen as an evidence-based box. Mm -hmm. So if you could, as we start out today, give us a short history around evidence-based practices from your years of experience and uh, some of your own training as well? Well, from what I have read, evidence-based practice primarily started in the medical field. In around the 1990s, it became a hot topic and so forth and so on. And that all makes sense to me. I mean, when I go see my physician, you know, I'm one of these people that they either love or hate because I Google everything, you know, and and I will go in and say, well, what about this research? And it says this and it's, you know, and I think it's great. Now, it didn't reach the mental health. Well, I shouldn't say it didn't reach the mental health professions because these things always just sort of ooze, you know, Mm -hmm. you can't get an exact starting date. But the American Psychological Association came out with a task force on evidence-based practice in 2006. So I think that shows the lag time and rightly so, because I do think it's much harder to try to think about using evidence-based practices in the mental health professions. We're a different kind of an animal, I feel. And like you said, when it does work, great, but I don't want to see us feel like we have to be in that little box because kind of that boxed in yeah yeah because I think what we do is much more than that there's a lot of nuance you know in what we do as you're as you're talking I kind of go back to how do they come up with some of the evidence-based practices that they certify if you will as best practice approaches and and we know that evidence-based practices refers to data from meta-analysis that they do random controlled trials that they do effectiveness studies and as well as information from you know from qualitative and ethnographic research as well as clinical observations they put this together to try and credential the treatment selections that clinicians are going to use for different diagnostic presentations there are some times where we're going to use those, but there is a lot of nuance in therapy. So there are some real strengths for sure to the evidence-based practice. And we want to be able to articulate what we're doing and where we're going in our work. But there are some times maybe when there are some limitations, aren't there? Maybe some challenges yes. just staying strictly with that. What are your thoughts around some of the limitations maybe that the evidence-based practices might kind of, like you said, maybe kind of keep us in a box around? Well, 
I know for me, and I'm I'm certainly not alone because I think most therapists would have some way to say that they have an intuition, an inner voice, a guidance, you know, a, a sixth sense, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Now, for strict evidence-based people or scientifically-based people, that's probably the thing they least want to hear because they, yeah. you know, that, that's what they're wanting to get rid of. But for me, it's it's valuable. I find off, well, not often, but reasonably often, I'll be sitting with a client, yeah. and you know, they'll be talking to me about whatever, yeah. and I will think, okay, I'm going to suggest that they do a or I. I don't make suggestions that often, but I'm going to mention the possibility of doing A, okay? And I am poised and set and ready to say that, and I open my mouth, and I find myself saying, well, have you considered trying? And before I can say A, I hear a little voice in my head that says B, And I switch gears in midstream and I am seamless. I tell you, no one ever catches it. And so I will say, have you considered trying B? And, you know, how evidence-based is that? How am I supposed to write that up in in a journal or or on my treatment plan? Or where did that come from? But I'm going to trust something, though, in that. I'm going to trust that in that moment, this is the nuance of therapy. And I believe that this is the art of therapy. Yes. It's the art in that moment. It's your clinical experience, your understanding of that person, the unique characteristics that you've learned about that person, whether it's their life stage or their developmental history or their readiness for change. All of those things I believe are going on in your head consciously or not Mm. that allow you in the art of therapy to say, I'm going to go with B and you take B Mm -hmm. and I'm going to trust that chances are you've got some pretty good outcomes with that B path. B works much better. (laughs) B is a much better therapist than than I am. (laughs) Yeah, it, 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 you know, I, I trust that inner voice totally. I mean, I, I, I don't waver when I feel like I am lucky enough to hear that inner guidance. I will trust it all the time. And I, and I do have better outcomes. I would love to encourage a clinician, just as you and I are talking about this, we have a little bit of age on us, both you and I, but I would love clinicians from what you're saying right there to learn to trust their gut. Now they have to have enough information. They have to have enough understanding of themselves, their own, you know, their own stuff and that they ideally have worked through. So it's not our stuff being worked out when we're working with people, but ideally I would love people to have done enough of their own work, to be experienced in their field, have a good theoretical orientation, but to really trust themselves in that therapeutic process, much like you're talking about seamlessly going with B, mm-hmm. there's something in that that suggests I'm going to trust this process and let's see where it goes with the person that's sitting in front of me. Yes, yes. Some of the factors that have been shown to be the most effective in terms of outcome, yes. one has to do with relationship between the therapist and the patient. And that seems to be overriding, doesn't matter what approach you're using. Yeah. The relationship is, uh, I don't want to quote statistics because I'm often wrong, but it's way up there. If not yes. always the highest thing, it's it's yeah. very close to it. The other thing is genuineness yeah. and that that matters to people yeah. and seems to predict a, a better outcome. Now, I was reading up on evidence-based practices before we started our podcast today because I feel like I'd don't know enough about it and I didn't want to not do it some justice and so I was reading up on it and I found this article that was talking about how important the concept of fidelity was in other words you fidelity to the evidence base to the research in other words the idea I came away with was when I'm sitting with a person I'm supposed to be tailoring my approach as closely to the research setting and yes. the research that it's steeped in or else how can I say it's really evidence based if you know if the research was done over here and I'm doing something different over here then I'm not being faithful to it and so I was thinking well that sounds pretty hard and then it said the next paragraph was about flexibility and I was like oh good okay yes. and and I read that and then it said however and it talked about how you should also be flexible and and I was like, okay, well, all of that's fine, 
But if my, <laughs> now this may just be my head and how my head works. Take us but, into it. But if my head is crowded with trying to think about being faithful, fidelity to the research, and also being flexible, where is there going to be room for that spark of inspiration? You can't be present enough. I cannot be spark. present. No. I cannot be present. I cannot be authentic. Mm -hmm. I can't be any of the things that to me produce good results. For, for me personally, I will gladly admit I am not good with cognitive-based therapies. I am not. When people come to me and say they want that, I say, I'm really lousy with that. You know, we really should find you another therapist because I'm not good at that. And, I, and I'm very serious about that. Yeah. But I think one of the things that bothers me the most, and I think my interest in wanting to do this with you today, is I, I think there's a tendency in the profession to see evidence-based as good yes. and everything else as less than. And, you know, insurance companies do it. Our professional associations do it by requiring right. everything. We, you know, if, if I'm going to present a paper or a class or something if, and I'm yes. going to apply, I have to list how I'm making it evidence-based. Right. And, you know, I don't see any place on there to say, how are you making it non-evidence-based? How are you going to help those people? It, it It's all skewed toward evidence-based and I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by saying that that's better than. Yeah, no, I really agree. It's almost becomes a, these are good ones and these are not the good ones. And what exactly. we know, yeah, we know it. And I think you're hitting a, a really good point there are diverse forms of psychotherapy guided by a myriad theoretical perspectives or a combination of models that get practiced. The majority of the evidence-based psychotherapies, like you're saying, are cognitive and behavioral in nature. But there are practitioners who are employing things like existential or humanistic, interpersonal. Yeah. You and I both work psychodynamically, yeah. Uh, you know, systems-oriented, and or maybe like we talked about, kind of an, kind of an integrated model. These are all very, very effective approaches to therapy with some yeah. really powerful research that shows that folks are really improving from these theoretical uh, approaches as well to these treatment conditions being presented, but not always seen or not always kind of almost like insurance, you know, credentialed or, or, or cited. Yeah. These are the best ones to do. And, and I yeah. think you're, you're hitting on something very, very good. These are good and these are not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like that hurts all of us, frankly, J just that mentality, just that mindset. I think, too, as you're talking about this, what comes up in my mind is that I think psychotherapies typically are trying to empower and support people in achieving their treatment goals. Yes. But sometimes the feeling is these evidence-based approaches kind of run the risk of not attending, per se, to the patients being the agents of their change yes, and being some of their own self healers. And we're along with them guiding and shepherding some things and nudging and witnessing. Yes. But sometimes this almost feels like a little bit like a plug and play here. Here's where you're going to fit in. Here's what we're going to do to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you're going to come out, you know, this new person thinking these new thoughts, whatever it may be, or have these behaviors that are different from before, mm -hmm. not a bad outcome goal. If you're thinking healthier thoughts and your behaviors are, are right. healthier, but the process and the way that we think about how to bring an approach to this. We want people to feel empowered that they are the ones yes. of their agents of change. They're the, they're actively involved in yes. their self healing. Yes. Give me your thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I've got a, a great example for that. One of the things that is difficult and again, talking about patients who Google is that I will sometimes get patients that I can see quite clearly are not going to be good evidence-based patients. They're just, yeah. they're just not, you know, with the people I work with, sometimes th there may be a pre-evidence-based therapy that's required. And, and then you get them to a place where they can then profit from some of the evidence-based methods. And that's Correct. fine. So I do the pre part because that's what I feel like I'm good at. And then you know, whatever, we go from there. But what happens is <laughs> patients who are like me and Google, and then they come to see me as their psychotherapist, they'll come in saying, well, I want to use evidence-based treatment methods because I've been reading and that's, that's what's best. 
And I'm sitting there groaning inside because I, I can see that that's not what this person needs. It's not right. going to help them. And I even, I even had one person come in and she had been to all sorts of evidence-based, you know, a week here for that treatment center and a week there and whatever. Yeah. And I could see very clearly that that wasn't what she needed to be doing. And so I just asked her, I said, well, did, did those help? No, they didn't, you know. And and so I said, okay, I have some different ways that I work. And yeah. would you like to try those? Yes. But she she couldn't shake that she felt like she needed evidence-based treatments yeah. because that's what had been presented to her as good. That's right. And that's uh, sometimes I try a bit, but truly I fail. I mean, I, I just don't do it well. So That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Behavioral and mental health professionals provide critical support to our communities in a time when our communities need it more than ever. But they need support too, to continue their education, to connect with colleagues, and to advance their career. And so we've launched Triad, the hub for behavioral and mental health professionals. At Triad, you'll find education, community, and career resources for both current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, all curated specifically for you and all for free. Visit us at hellotriad.com slash BHT to register for your free professional account. Again, that's hellotriad.com slash BHT. Come join the community today. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you tried to warn her. Like I tell you a funny story. <laughs> tell me. I had, a, I had a guy come in one time and see me. He said, Graham, I'd uh, like you to kind of have an approach like Dr. Phil. <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't work like Dr. Phil. I'm sorry. It's just not my, it's not my style. But, you know, he said, I think, I, I think I need some confrontation and, you know, someone to be pretty explicit with me. And I said, well, I, I'm probably not the right fit. No, Graham, I've heard good things. I love to come see you. So I, I decided to see him for a couple of sessions. <laughs> And I shaved my head, got a little bit bigger, and I presented myself <laughs> as Dr. Phil. And uh, I was sitting in front of him, and I, I, uh, I can be confrontative at times when necessary, but my, my approach is to hold people in a place and walk them into the place where they get to understand themselves, kind of yeah. three-pointers, as I call it. Yeah. So anyway, for the first two sessions, I was uh, fairly, I was, I was kind, but I was pretty assertive and pretty explicit in things that I was seeing very, very dialed in and very pinpointed. And, and it was, it was kind of hard uh -huh, at the uh -huh. end of the second, at the end of the second session, he said, Graham, can I, can we maybe go back maybe to the way that you say you work? Cause I think you felt, <laughs> I think you felt like that was just a little too intense and maybe quite not the readiness, you know, to, to kind of hold that kind of information uh, presented quite in that way. So we, kind of went back to another approach. He did well in therapy, but just kind of funny to watch and see people come yeah. in sometimes. And and sometimes, you know, with psychotherapy, folks don't know what they don't know coming in. They, yes. They, it'd be like me going to the eye doctor saying, can you run this test for me, please? Yes. I have no idea. Yes. Or I need to go for, for an imaging. Is that going to be a CAT scan or a PET scan or a MRI? I, I don't know. So yeah. I can't yeah. come in and, you know, prescribe that. So we're asking folks to really trust us. Yes. That we're trained, that we've done our own work, that we are successful in the approaches that we select for the, the presenting problems that they have. But yeah, when, when they when they hear some things, sometimes they come in and say, can we try this? Sometimes they don't know what they don't know. We get to help them. And that's part of the yeah. education, I believe, yeah. in our work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, I think that's another piece too, that you're kind of highlighting here. And maybe I'm joining you in on part of, I believe our work is to help folks understand what therapy is. Only more recently has psychology through the APA and our, our uh, other research began to help folks understand what therapy really is. Part of this clinical series that we're doing right now, the clinician series, is trying to take people behind the door to kind of demystify some of these things because people have been educated about, you know, psychotherapy, at least historically, through one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Bob Newhart, if you're that, yes. you know, get some age on you. And maybe <laughs> yes. Kelsey Grammer, you know. And yes. psychology has always been presented as a little quirky and a little weird, and mm -hmm. and it's not. There's some mm -hmm. really great folks coming in for therapy, some really great folks yes. doing this work. Yes. And the work is dynamic, and it's life-changing. Yes. But part of our work, is, I believe, is to educate folks as to, let's talk about what therapy is and what we can experience together. And what you said earlier on is that the relationship yeah. is the cornerstone to everything. When we're talking about mental illness happenings, typically secondary within the context of 
relationships going sideways and awry in people's lives. And what yes. we as therapists get to be in this relationship with folks is a corrective other. Yes. We get to provide corrective emotional experiences for people to have new experiences with the same old beginning, same old beginning with a different ending. Yes. And so I yes. think part of the educational piece, how do you do that with your work? Well, that's a very important part of what I do. And one of the things that I always feel, and this is if I am the patient or if I am the therapist, either either role, but it's easier to describe from a patient. From the patient role, I never mind if my therapist makes, quote, a mistake. Exactly. If they say or do something that hurts me, upsets me, right. you know, what it triggers me, whatever it is, what I do mind or what I watch for totally is how do they handle that with me? Yeah. When, when, when I bring it back to them and say, and, and you know, if it happens right there in the moment, I, I will tell them right then, but sometimes it's the next session or whatever. When I say, you know, that, that, it was really that was really hurtful and blah, blah 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 and you know if i've got someone who can hear me non-defensively and i don't know if they even have to apologize sometimes they can but the most important thing is i want them to hear why that hurt me i i want to be seen really understand yes. i, I want to be seen and understood yeah. even in that moment of when they hurt me yeah you know, you know i i think in that moment too that's where resilience gets built. Cause sometimes when we've had so many hurts, we're kind of brittle yes. and we're watching for things to be done just perfectly. So we can have a corrective experience, but life is not like that. Yes. Relationships are messy at times and make mistakes. And what you're saying here is if we make a mistake, maybe a healthy relationship where yes. the therapist can say, man, and, 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 you know, the patient can say that, that really hurt or the, or the therapist can say, and I've said this, man, I really blew that. Yes. I've done that too. I have, I've done I that have too. too. I said, you know, I didn't hear that properly. Did I, or maybe yeah. I made an assumption that, that that was really off base and was really hurtful to you. And I'm really sorry. Can we can, yes. we, can we talk about what that was like for you or what you experienced in that? And then yes. we almost usually can tie it back into something in their past. Well, take yes. it from there. Take it from there. Yes. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, that, that's exactly – I think you and I work very similarly because I see that the times when – clients will come to me and yeah. tell me the things that were hurtful i am always secretly just delighted you know it, it, it it's like when when they trust the relationship enough to tell me when i've hurt them yes. and i i am just delighted of course i don't smile or try not to and <laughs> you know i listen you know but inside i'm yeah. smiling because i know yeah. there's a huge potential for healing here I and it's uh, yeah and then like you said once i've heard them from where they are if the time is right we can maybe take it back and see okay. how it how it pl does plug in and you know all of that i love the emphasis that for someone to bring that to our attention, that is manifestation and evidence of a tremendous amount of trust Yes, that they have. Because in the past, when they might have brought things like disappointment or someone not getting them or hearing them or seeing them, yes, that would likely have ended in disappointment or maybe even punishment, probably something yes. along those lines, yes. pleasure, pleasure, pain, something, but not getting their need met. So for them to bring up and say, hey, I'm really scared to do this, but I need to tell you, you missed something last time or you, you, you didn't get it the way that I needed you to get it is a huge demonstration of trust honoring. I believe the relationship that we have built. Yes. And I love to hold that up in such an appreciative way that says, look at what we're doing. We're doing some right things here. Yeah. If you yeah. can bring this up and you and I can be strong enough and have the emotional muscle together yeah. to raise this. And then what we find is that they're able to take that experience with us out into other relationships, you know, in the here and now is with us mm -hmm. in the there and then is with others where they get to say the same thing, maybe to a spouse or mm -hmm. to a best friend and get to say, Hey, can I share something with you where I didn't feel seen or didn't feel heard yeah. what they did with us then gets to be generalized. Doesn't it? Yes, 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 yes. Although I do caution people with, with that piece. Not everyone can listen to, to people non-defensively. And so I, I am careful when someone says, well, I'm going to go confront my boss at work because she did such and such. I say, yeah. wait a minute, let's talk mm -hmm. about that first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From what you know of your boss, how likely is it that mm -hmm. they will be able to hear you non-defensively? Yeah. 
and, you know, parameters around that. I think that's Um, a good point. Yeah, because I don't want them hurt again. You know, it it could set them back. Yeah. One of the things I'm trusting in that is that at some level, if someone's confronting me about something as a, as a therapist and saying, hey, Graham, you kind of missed the mark on that, or I don't feel you really got that, or I think that interpretation that we made together doesn't fit. What I'm seeing in that, I'd be curious in your thoughts on this. I'm seeing that they trust the relationship enough to test this out. And then yes. secondly, at some level, I think maybe more unconsciously, what they've built and I referred to it earlier as emotional muscle, it's, it's, it's affective tolerance, the ability to say, wow, what I couldn't do earlier in my life, mm-hmm. bring my needs and my feelings to somebody because it yes. wasn't safe because I couldn't handle the disappointment. Maybe it's because of the power differential or maybe because I was dependent. I couldn't take those risks, but as an adult, maybe I can be stronger I need to say it in the right way. I need to con- I need to confront you or say some things in, in a correct way so you can hear me. Mm-hmm. However, if you can't because you're impaired or you're half cocked or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. and you disappoint me just maybe this time, I can still walk away feeling successful because the success <laughs> at this point is not so much you getting me, although I would like that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's me being able to have a voice maybe that I wasn't able to have before. Maybe at some level I'm thinking, I'm, maybe I'm strong enough to tolerate disappointment, even if you can't get me. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Oh, I think that's, that's perfect. That's yeah. perfect. That, that's the, in, in, my, in my mind, that's the ultimate treatment goal yeah. is, you know, all of us love being heard and understood. That's, you know, that's a dopamine producer. It makes us feel good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we are so much more resilient and can, you know, function in the world so much better when we're not so dependent on whether that other person gets us or doesn't get us or whatever. I think and so, yeah, I, I think in that moment, you're working from a kind of a trauma model and a fear-based mm-hmm. way of mm-hmm. living life to a life that says, I'm going to be okay, but let me be honest and authentic in my life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. That's some good stuff. You know, you and I started talking today and we had talked in a prior show about making this an evidence-based talk and about when when it works and when it's applicable kind of in those situations. And also when you kind of go outside that box and Mm -hmm. what we're seeing here is there is at the heart of it, the warmth, empathy, and genuineness of what Roger talks about. That's what you were suggesting earlier on that, 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 that authenticity that we are genuinely showing up in a caring warm and empathic way for those that are coming to see us. And we are willing to join them in Yes, a discovery process, a growth process, a, a transcendent experience, maybe that they haven't had before. And what a privilege it is for us to sit with them in that process. Yes. Do you yes. feel that? Oh, I do. I do. It, it's Isn't that a um, joy. Yes. It, it's such an honor to me to Good have word. someone trust me that much yeah. that they will share with me and disclose yeah. and, allow me on their journey. Yeah. When you put it that way, I think that relationships are typically where mental health illnesses develop, where they, again, go awry and sideways. Mm -hmm. But relationships like one with a therapist can be corrective. Absolutely. They can allow the, they, they can allow the environment and the experience to do and go back through some of those developmental steps that they weren't able to go through to develop those things Mm -hmm. that they so need Mm -hmm. and can attain in their adult lives to achieve their fullest potential that got limited by the pain from relationships and the takeaways from that that went sideways. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Well, you know, I know we're kind of winding down in our time and it's been, (laughs) it's been fun to talk shop. Yes, it has. (laughs) One of my hopes just to kind of put it out there again for these clinical series is for folks to understand the hearts of therapists what goes on behind the door to try and demystify some things, to let them know that this is about some really well-researched, scientifically tested approaches, data-driven approaches. But there's also the clinical experience and the heart and the relational component, like you're so emphasizing today, Susan, that comes into the therapy experience. Clearly, you're loving what you do. Yes, I do. (laughs) (laughs) I do. I, I wish do. folks could see the smile on your face right now just from <laughs> ear to ear as you talk about it. Yeah, well, Susan, yeah. thank you so much, as always, for being on our show. I know we're going to have you back and in different capacities, but so appreciate you being with us today, talking shop, 
and sure loved having you. Thanks so much, Graham. It was fun being here. I enjoyed talking shop with you. <laughs> I enjoyed as well. Okay. And I want to thank our listeners for joining us today as well. Triad is so pleased to have guests like Susan the way we have, and we are pleased to have you as our listeners as well. And we'll look forward to having you next time on Triad's Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.